good to be in God's house this morning as we continue uh, our series this morning. Uh, I want to let you know, or introduce you rather, to somebody, uh, my nephew Mark Christensen, who is a, uh, going to be a senior at Trevec and Nazarene University in Nashville, is up here this summer, and he's going to be working with us in a variety of areas. Uh, you'll see him with our teams and also with our uh, worship team. He's a talented musician, and uh, he is going to be here. So I just want, would you welcome Mark for me this morning? Come on up, Mark. And we're going to go uh, a little bit earlier to the verse than we normally would, Vicki. But Mark, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, that somebody, something somebody might not know about you. Of course, for them, that would be anything. So you, it's, it's for, you come over here a little closer there. Um, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I'm the only part of my extended family that lives in the South, so everyone uh, lives up here in the Pacific Northwest. So yeah, I've been here a couple times, but I've only been to this church like once, and it was like 10 years ago. So yeah, it's good to be back. <laughs> he was much smaller then. So, uh, and so he is actually living with Anita and I, and that's uh, as you can imagine, fairly traumatic for him. And so he's looking for some escapes. So if you have uh, if you're a young person, we've got some college age people here, it looks like this morning, or if you have teenage sons who like to play video games and eat, uh, would you invite him over occasionally or invite him out? Uh, Aaron, would you invite him out uh, so, that, uh, so that he does not have to dwell in my house all summer? That's also for me, by the way, okay? So anyway, I've asked Mark to share our verse with us this morning. Mark, could you bring the passage this morning? Why don't we stand out of respect for God's word? This is Matthew 5, 38 through 48. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what, re what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thank you, Mark. You may be seated. Let's dive into our uh, scripture this morning, and we're going to move real quickly as we're a little bit behind. Uh, I was having a meal with a friend recently, and uh, he told me about a lifelong relationship that came to an end this last year due to division over the election. And he was sad about it. I've actually heard lots of stories like that this year, and probably some of you have heard them as well. The pandemic and politics have had an adverse effect on many relationships, and elections and pandemics and masks and vaccines seem to give people a lot to argue about. Uh, and as a society, uh, fueled by opinion television and social media, many seem to have embraced fighting. I saw this headline recently, and, and I thought it sort of summed up the last year Perfectly. This headline says, the pandemic uh, made us miss our friends, but also hate them. Uh, and that's unfortunate, right? Let me share you the, with you my concern as we, we get going here today. I'm not bothered by differences of opinions. Uh, there's a, a good chunk of people in this room this morning, and I'm guessing for every person in this room this morning, there's an opinion, right? And uh, we don't even agree with the person we live with all of the time, right? In fact, we don't even agree with the person we live with most of the time for some of us, right? But we can still love one another. Differences have existed since the Garden of Eden. Here's my concern. Did last year make Christian people, or maybe a better way of putting it is, did last year make me look and sound and act more like Jesus or less? Our passage this morning is from the Sermon on the Mount. These verses uh, that Mark just read are revolutionary. 
Jesus is challenging the ethics of his listeners. And he's, he's already made before this passage some pretty bold statements. He's just compared calling someone a fool or worthless to murder. And he said, if you even look lustfully at another person, in your mind you're guilty of adultery. So he has set a very high bar. But you have to understand what Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount is about what God's people look like. And Jesus Christ is most profoundly concerned with making a group of people here on earth that look like him, that share his ethic, that have the same desires for uh, the world that he has, that live lives of sacrifices. He wants to make a different people. So does the Church of Jesus Christ first look like Jesus, and because of that then look different. He makes the most difficult point when he starts out talking about those we hate, those who would hurt us, those who would try to take things from us, rob us. So let's take a look this morning at this passage of Scripture, and let's talk a little bit about loving others when loving is hard, okay? Because for some, and in some particular relationships this year, Loving has been hard, correct? It's been a challenge. First off, for followers of Christ, we need to be focused on reconciliation as opposed to retribution. And something I've said multiple times over the last 16 months, we need to be more concerned with doing right than enforcing our rights. Does that make sense? that the rest of the world seems to love retribution. You know what, you know what, uh, you know, you know how, what phrase is used for that now? Uh, we're owning those people. We own them. Totally own that guy online. You know? And I would argue that owning somebody or beating somebody in the public forum or putting them down or destroying them or whatever is not uniquely Christian. Jesus starts out by quoting an Old Testament law that's actually, uh, quoted, uh, that's actually used rather in multiple verses uh, in the Old Testament in several different books, this idea of an eye for an eye as a legal precedent. But he says this, I tell you, don't even resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and, and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Jesus here, now I want to be, let's talk a little bit about the language being used here. Jesus, I think, is at some level here using hyperbole or exaggeration. But I think he's doing that to make a profound point. Like For instance, his hearers would have understood in Middle Eastern culture, in that part of the world with the climate, people largely would have worn two layers of clothing, a cloak and then an under, a garment underneath it. So when Jesus was saying, don't just give them your, your uh, cloak, give them your shirt as well, uh, you know, especially as poorer listeners would have thought, hmm, if I do that, I'll be naked. Um, and I don't think you know, Jesus was you know, a big, strong proponent of public nudity. Uh, so I think at some level here, he's, he's using exaggeration to communicate a point. But in the other sense, this is the same person, Jesus Christ, who told us that we have to take up our cross. So I think what he is saying here is this is an incredibly radical way of living, this Christian way. And it is even more radical when times get tough, when the prevailing culture is unkind, when the prevailing culture is hurtful. Let me give you a couple caveats before we dive in a little bit further. Number one, uh, this, this idea of turning the other cheek and giving away more than what is asked of you, this isn't a call uh, or this isn't Jesus setting up someone to be re-victimized. What do I mean by that? Well, there are some, probably, if statistics are, are true, several in here this morning who have been victims of violent crime or a sex crime or abuse. Uh, and I don't think uh, God, I think God wants to protect yourself from your abuser. Does that make sense? I don't think Jesus expects you to uh, 
to uh, engage your abuser necessarily. I, I do think that God can use other people to deal with your abuser, and I think you then can work through, your, through forgiveness and release in your own life. It's also not a call to ignore injustice. If we see injustice in the world, I think we're absolutely obligated to speak out to it. I was reading, one of the commentaries I read this week said this, and I thought it was spot on. We must resist injustice and refuse to comply with demands that compromise justice, but we must do so in kindness and love, not with violence or retribution. You know, in my words, in the words that I kind of came to mind for me is, we have to be Christ-like when facing injustice. We also need to make sure it's injustice and not just inconvenience. I think there's, in our culture, a confusion between injustice and inconvenience, and I think that's something we need to consider. So, moving on. The goal of this passage is that our life has to be a message. Our life needs to be a message. Our actions need to be communicating something to people. One of the interesting things about this passage is in this culture, a backhanded slap to the face would have been the most egregious of insults. It was designed to belittle. It was designed to demean. It was designed to humiliate, to rob someone of their dignity. And in fact, there were even legal remedies at the time for being slapped in the back of the face. And Jesus says, that happens to you? Give him the other cheek. What's he saying here? He's saying we need to be ambassadors. We need to be reconcilers. There's this great story from British history. True story. There's a famous club in London called the Garrick Club. And uh, a famous British uh, dramatist by the name of Frederick Lonsdale was asked by Seymour Hicks, who was one of the head of the, the club, to reconcile with a fellow member. The two had quarreled in the past and had never restored their friendship. And Hicks said to Lonsdale, you must reconcile. It is very unkind to be unfriendly at this time. Go over now and wish him a happy new year. And Lonsdale crossed the room begrudgingly and looked at his enemy and said, I wish you a happy new year, but only one. <laughs> You know, I, I think that what Jesus is talking about here is much deeper than I wish you a happy new year, but only one. It's not just simply saying the right words, but it is wanting that of the other person, wanting the best of the other person. When we see an enemy, we need to respond like Jesus, and we need to see a possibility. We're in a world right now that sees far too many enemies. We need to embrace possibilities. Possibilities. Look for possibilities. And you know what that means? That means when we see something going on or somebody hurting us, we need to work really hard to how we're going to manage those thoughts of somebody hurting us. There's a great verse. It actually is in a context of talking about sort of troubled times and difficult relationships. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets up against the knowledge of God. And we, this idea that we take captive every thought to make it obedience to, obedient to Christ. In our anger, in our frustration, in our woundedness, those are the times when it's usually the most difficult to take captive our thoughts. But it's precisely the time when it is most vital to take up uh, and, and control our thoughts. When we perceive a hard-to-love person, this is an opportunity for us to love. It's an opportunity uh, for us to think about and focus on the other person. Ask some questions. Acknowledge some truths. They were created by God. They were created in the image of God. While you may be struggling with them and while you may have harbor ill feelings towards them at the moment, God does still, in fact, love them. And perhaps most importantly, God desires a relationship with them. And here's an interesting thought. The way you deal with reconciliation with your enemy, particularly if they're not someone who knows Jesus, may teach them much about Jesus. It's a hard one, isn't it? The way you deal with conflict with somebody who uh, does not know Jesus may teach them a little bit about, a, about Jesus. Now, let, let me... Let me tell you, when I'm attacked, I will be honest with you, I really have to work hard on, on take captive thoughts because I, from a t it is amazing how uh, 
quickly I can move from feeling like I'm attacked to scheming to uh, devise some plan uh, to cause the downfall publicly of my enemy. I'm like a, I, I immediately start thinking, well, I, retribution is a really natural response for me. So I have to work really hard to take captive thoughts. It's very natural for us to want to protect our rights, our feelings, and our stuff. Jesus here is pointing out pri priorities when he talks about what we're supposed to do when attacked. Wounds are temporary compared to future glory. Stuff is temporary. Our time belongs to him. Somebody wants to walk a mile with us, let's walk two with him. Our resources belong to him, our cloak, our shirt. So we need to really, when we're attacked, when we're hurting, when we're dealing with difficult people, think of something higher here. What is God trying to teach me, and how can God use me in this circumstance? Now, next, we as a Christian people need to work hard to stand in opposition to the prevailing culture of hate. And here Jesus gives two instructions. We are to love, and then he gives us an action step. We're to pray for our enemies. That's, that's powerful. Look what he says. In, in opposition to owning our enemies, Jesus says, you've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and, and unrighteous. Rain in that time was seen as a blessing in this dry, arid region where these people were hearing these words for the first time. Rain was seen as a blessing, and Jesus makes the point that God seems to uh, put his blessings both on those we like and those we don't like, which is an interesting thought. Unlike earlier, Jesus isn't quoting the Old Testament when he said, he, he said uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's not a quote from the Old Testament. What he's doing there is he may be referring to some false teaching of, of the Pharisees or sort of popular teaching in the culture of that day or just the prevailing attitudes of culture. Still, he's, he's prescribing a completely different way of doing life, isn't he? He's talking about a whole different way of doing things. It's still an affront to me how many Christians treat other Christians poorly, or even non-Christians poorly on social media? I am bothered every time I see a Christian person attack another person on social media. There are far better ways to go about that. I'm not talking about commenting on political posts, as long as it's not attacking a person, or having an opinion. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the specific targeting of another person on a public forum. Pick up the phone and talk to them instead, or private message them. We have far too many hateful things coming from people who claim the blood of Jesus. God have mercy on us. The way we communicate publicly is something that we're teaching our young. So we need to be wise in how we communicate. The name calling that some engage in is the opposite of gospel. It is the opposite of good news that we're called to be ambassadors for. I read this historical story recently. It's a great story. War times are a tough time. War time is a time where lines are, are drawn, right? And, and, and bitter lines can be drawn. I read a story recently, it was an actual news clipping, about two people, Peter Miller, and a man by the name of Michael Whitman, who was, by all accounts, a very difficult human being that made life miserable for other people. Uh, there was this Baptist pastor during the American Revolution, his name was Miller, who lived in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, and enjoyed a, a good friendship with George Washington. In Ephrata also lived Michael Whitman, an evil-minded sort who did all he could do to publicly oppose and humiliate the pastor. You can read about it if you go online. One day Whitman was arrested for treason and he was sentenced to die. Miller traveled 70 miles on foot to Philadelphia to plead for the life of this traitor. George Washington said, no, Peter, I cannot grant life. Or, I, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. To, to which Miller said, my friend, he's the bitterest enemy I have. What? cried Washington. You've walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a different light. 
I will grant you your pardon. Peter Miller was the one that transported Whitman back to Ephrata. He went to Washington seeking to save an enemy. He returned to Ephrata with a new friend. How we treat our enemies can have a profound impact on the gospel, on evangelism, on what we say to the world. I can imagine no greater image of the spirit of Jesus at work than making an enemy a friend. It's one of the hardest things to do, isn't it? Then, then Jesus goes on here and he says another thing. He says, don't, don't just love your enemies. Pray for them. He gives us an action step. I was with one of my small groups this week, and one of the men in the small group said, you know, he's just gotten in the, the habit of praying for his enemies. He started doing it several years ago, I, I think as a result of sort of all the political turmoil. And he made the comment of what a difference it makes in his heart and attitude when he's praying for his enemies. It's easy to pray for your kids, your parents. What about those who've wounded you? Finally this, let's work to make love active. Love is not just an attitude, love has it. I mean, we talk about our, our, our head and our hands, right? Our head is where we have our emotions and our, our thought life. And it's one thing to, to do forgiveness and reconciliation up here. It's another thing to, to offer love with our hands. Instead of making a fist, can we fold our hands in prayer? Instead of getting ready to fight, can we bring even our deepest enemies to God? One of the things I've learned over the years, Norm, I bet you've experienced this in your teaching and in, 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 in working at, at Wenatchee Family Counseling Services, loving action oftentimes leads to a loving heart. In, a word, in other words, you don't have to feel like loving before acting like loving. And then oftentimes when you start to act like love, you might be surprised that the feelings follow. Jesus said, if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that? We're called to be greeting people who are different, loving people who are different. Who are the others? People who are not like us. People who listen to different music or have different skin color, or who eat different food, people who voted for a different candidate. These are all people that we can love. Having been through recovery ministry myself and having led recovery ministry for a while, there's a term that I've found quite helpful in my life over the years. And for those of you who've ever maybe gone through uh, AA or NA or Celebrate Recovery, you've probably heard this phrase, fake it until you make it. Fake it until you make it. It sounds a little callous at first blush, but if you start to think about it in your own life, if you start to consistently do the right thing, even when it's hard, feelings follow. Almost always. Act in a way that you know is right, even if you don't feel like it. By the way, I believe just from a divine perspective, God will reward your obedience. God will reward your changed attitude. Not only that, we believe in a little thing in our camp called provenient grace. This idea that God is always working and God initiates relationship with humanity. And so that God is in fact, going out and even working in the heart of your enemy without you even being aware of it. God can do that. And so when we come in prayer, it's a profound thing. C.S. Lewis, who's, a, as you know, one of my favorite authors, realized this to be true in his own life. He said this, the rule of all of us is perfectly simple. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. 
As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you love somebody, you will presently come to love him. There is indeed one exception. If you do him a good turn, not to please God and obey the law of charity, but to show him what a fine, forgiving chap you are, and to put him in your debt, and then sit down to wait for his gratitude, you'll probably be disappointed. This is simply loving for love's sake, and loving like Jesus would have us to love. Have you seen your relationships fractured this year? I don't know if it's too soon to reach out to that person. Maybe it is, but I can guarantee it's not soon, too soon to pray for that relationship. Pray for forgiveness if it's necessary for you. And pray for your one-time friend. Pray for your political adversary. Pray for those who would do you harm. You may be surprised at the miracles that God will work when you do that. Consider how God would want you to treat your enemies. In just a second, we're going to pray this line, a line that we've prayed over and over again for months. The line that stands out to me today is this, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's interesting, this Lord's Prayer, how it has an application to the sermon every week. It just how God works, it's amazing. As you pray those lines this morning, take those words to heart and consider what God would have you do. Let's stand as we close in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.